All right, at 7.30, we'll go ahead and get started with the first regularly scheduled meeting of the September uh, Potts Grove School Board. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order. And we're going to start with a presentation of the colors by the JROTC. And at this time, I would request that everybody stand for the presentation of the colors. Seats. So that was um, the JROTC unit that uh, drills over at Pottstown High School. The folks tonight were all from Potts Grove High School. They gave a, they had a special detail from just Potts Grove, uh, but the, the unit is made up of both Pottstown and Potts Grove students. So thank you to them and for the major who was here tonight. Uh, bringing them to us. So thanks everybody for participating in that. So at this time we'll have uh, the role. The secretary will note the role. Everybody's here but Al Leach, our vice president. And moving on. Executive session announcements. I don't have anything noted. So there was no executive session since the last meeting. So I'll turn it over to you for... Okay, good evening, everyone. At this time, I'd like to turn the, uh, our meeting over to Dr. Jones and uh, her team to present a uh, presentation regarding morning meetings here at Ringing Rocks Elementary. Dr. Jones. Good evening. Welcome to Ringing Rocks. This evening, we would like to share with you something that we've been, we've been doing at our school for um, about two years now, and it's something called morning meeting. As the teachers and I began to study some of the things that were occurring in our school, noticing that the landscape and our classrooms had been evolving, we asked ourselves how we could better meet the social and emotional needs of our students in order for them to be you know, as academically successful as possible. Well, what we as educators knew from experience was solidified by a variety of the research that we looked at, quite notably the research and the work of the Center for Responsive Schools. And the guiding principles there align actually with um, Mr. Lingren, something that you said at a recent um, school board meeting when you were talking about the importance of us continuing to teach and promote kindness and civility with our students. Well, research has consistently demonstrated that cognitive growth occurs through social interactions. In fact, a recent analysis of over 200 studies found that students who receive instruction in social and emotional learning had more positive attitudes and improved, or had more positive attitudes about school, and, shown, and they showed an improvement of over 11 percentile points on standardized achievement tests. So what we know is that if we want our students to be successful academically and socially, they need to learn the skills of cooperation, assertiveness, responsibility, empathy, and self-control. 
So knowing this to be true, a number of the teachers here at Ringing Rocks, especially Mrs. Robinson and Ms. Claus, embarked on the use of morning meeting as a primary forum in which to integrate social interaction with academic skill development. So we are, we are, we've been so pleased with the results of morning meeting here at Ringing Rocks that we did train our staff. And I will have to say that Mrs. Robinson and Ms. Claus took a leadership role in that. And I do want to say to you, um, I want to just point out, because I, I know you're always interested when you send teachers to conferences, when you send administrators to conferences, what is the outcome of that? Well, you're going to see that tonight because Mrs. Robinson attended a conference, um, Ms. Claus has been doing her graduate work, and um, so we're very happy with their leadership and our implementation of morning meetings. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to them and our students so that you will have a better picture of what a morning meeting is and what the benefits are to our students. So if I could have our students and Mrs. Robinson and Ms. Claus come up. Do we have another microphone that isn't attached or is this our only microphone? This is it. So boys and girls, this is gonna be a little bit different than what we practiced. It's okay, you're gonna come on over. I'm good, I'm live, okay. Uh, good evening. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Jones and all of you uh, for giving us this opportunity to talk about um, morning meetings. Dr. Jones has given us a wonderful overview of the research behind morning meetings and classroom communities. And Mrs. Robinson and I uh, will now provide some feedback as to what this looks like in the primary classroom, as will our students. When students enter our classroom on the first day, they're greeted with a large banner that reads, Classroom Family and underneath is each one of their pictures. Next to this is a sign that reads, family means you are part of something beautiful and you will be loved unconditionally no matter what. Within a classroom family, students are given a sense of love and belonging, a basic need that is essential for learning to occur. Through our daily meetings, students will find commonalities and differences with each other. Today I believe our topic was our favorite ice cream toppings, correct? <laughs> They'll learn about each other's strengths that might be expressed artistically, or maybe if it's One Word Wednesday, they will be asked in one word to sum up how they're feeling that morning. And perhaps on Tell Me Something Tuesday, they'll tell their classmates about a joy or concern they are experiencing in their lives. A strong classroom community is the backbone of academic growth and learning. And with the academic rigors being what they are, Students are often required to step outside their comfort zones to take risks and find success. Students must be able to work and solve problems together, whether it's solving a difficult math equation or a disagreement that arose at recess. At any age, this requires a community of trust, acceptance, and safety. I'm wondering if you can hear me if I stand, because I have a box of stuff to share. Okay. What I'm going to start with is the four components of morning meeting. So when we have morning meetings, every day it's traditionally the same. We may move it out of order depending on what we're doing, but every day we hit the same thing. So each day we start with a greeting. Um, the beginning of the year, we spend time learning different languages. So each day we pick one of the different ways to say hello, we pass around whatever we're passing, and everybody says hello to each other. So this is good one for learning about other cultures, but it also lets children know each other's names, because I'm sure you've heard in May somebody say, that child there, and you go, who is that child? I don't know his or her name. So one of the things we work really hard on is being able to make sure everybody knows each other's names. Along with that, let me know if you can't hear me, um, we have a bin of things that they get to pick out um, and we pass around. So each day it's something different. And the great thing about this is we have stuffed animals, we have toys, but we also have baby dolls. So the wonderful thing is second graders, boys and girls, hold those dolls, clap their hands, clap their feet, 
So it's really allowing a time for them to be in a safe environment where they can be the child that they should be able to be. Um, so that's the first part that we do is the greeting. The next part is the sharing, and Ms. Claus had shared um, the different types of things that they share. Um, so some days it may be, like every Monday is always, what did you do over the weekend? And if you don't want to share that, what are you looking forward to this week? And every Friday is, what are you looking forward to once the bell rings? So those are the same, but everything else changes based on what they're learning academically or what's going on in the classroom or their social emotional needs at that time. The third part is the group activity. So that can be, sometimes it is passing, sometimes it's songs, it's yoga, it's poems and chants. Right now, our classroom, we're really into the songs, so that's where we're spending a lot of our time. And then the last part is the morning message. So morning message, every classroom here at Rock starts the day with some, uh, some type of morning message. And that gets us focused for the day of learning because it's really important for everybody to know what's at stake for the day, what they need to be able to accomplish. So it gets everybody on the same page so that our day can be it. Morning meetings only take from 10 to 20 minutes. So it doesn't take a really long time to have that connection with everybody. So there are reasons that we do morning meeting and not just because it's fun, but it is a lot of fun to have. Um, one of the reasons is that every day starts together. So if the students get up in the morning and they have a bad morning or they have a great morning, or if I'm at a faculty meeting and I'm running late, everybody comes together, sits down, and starts that day together. So it gets us all to regroup, have some fun, um, make sure that we're all calm and ready to begin our learning. Um, the students get to hear their names every day. So one of the things I was really surprised with is when I was doing my research, I had found out that many students can go through days without having someone in school refer to them by their name. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize that that would occur. So every single day, at least one time that day, they hear somebody say, hello, Mr. Nestor, or hola, Mr. Nestor. And they go, yes, I matter. And that's really important if we want them to be able to do what we want them to do during the day. Um, the students also know that their social needs are valued. So another thing is that piece of research where it says children are social beings, they are social beings. So if we want them to give us the academic demands that we're putting on them, we need to make sure that we're providing for them to have the social time. Um, the other piece, I was just doing some research over the weekend, and they were saying there is a huge connection between morning meetings and literacy skills. So because there isn't that stress of, I have to write out a test, or I have to answer this academic question in front of my student, or in front of my classmates, they have the opportunity to practice um, speaking, practice answering um, education-related questions or academic questions without the pressure of this is our ELA block or this is our math block. So that's a really big deal in our classroom. So those children that may not volunteer during those academic blocks, in morning meeting, they do take the time to share what it is that they um, are asked to share. Um, they also develop empathy, compassion, and acceptance. This is huge in today's society. Um, the more we learn about each other, the less scary differences are. Um, the more we learn how to feel for one another, um, the more understanding and the more we can be there. So there are times when students will share something sad that happened over the weekend. And that allows their classmates to ask more questions. And that also allows the student to say, I don't want to discuss it any further. So these are all skills that are really needed. And they're learning this in a K-2 building. And you can walk into these meetings and you can see these conversations taking place. Um, and the other thing is they learn about one another. So they don't just learn who's good at reading and who's good at math. They're learning who likes hockey and who doesn't like broccoli, because a lot of times vegetables are not a favorite in morning meeting. Um, so they have that time as well um, to learn things. So the other piece that I want to share is what I've done is I had gone around and I asked people, what are things that you have seen since you started morning meeting? And I'm going to share a side thing that's not even in our notes, but Mrs. Benedict, a kindergarten teacher, had said the one year, last year she had passed around mirrors for the children to look in and tell people what they saw. And she said the facial expressions of the kindergartners as they looked at themselves in the mirror, she said she'll never forget it. It was priceless just to watch them. Because again, in our academic setting, we're always so much in a hurry to teach 
that we forget that these kiddos are just little kids. Um, we have an active, um, engaging learning environment because they start to trust each other, they take chances, they're willing to help one another more freely. That comes from morning meeting. And I will say that since I started it, I can see a change in the students that come through my room. We have um, students that really desire routine. And they know that every single day there is going to be a morning meeting. And they do not let you miss it, and that's okay. It's really important to the start of their day. They're more on task during their academic time because they got their time to have fun and be social. The shy students, so a couple of my favorite stories are I had a student who didn't talk ever. So one of the key parts to morning meeting is there's no pressure. We are patient. We're learning a lot of skills. And it was probably a third of the way through the year, and he would start answering questions. They weren't long, but answering questions. At recess, he started to play with his friends. By the end of the year, he was doing the floss in the middle of our classroom. So these types of things are really making a difference. I have another student who up until last year struggled to make friends. Sometimes she just couldn't find the right words. You know, things were tough for her. Through morning meeting, she was able to figure out how to interact, how to respond to someone, how to ask somebody for help with something. She turned herself around so fast in that year. And I have another student who last year um, was one of the first years that uh, he was able to be in a regular ed classroom for long periods of time. First time learning how to be social. Remarkable to watch his transformation during that year. Behavior problems, way down. Interaction with his classmates and friendships, way up. So those things are just things that, like those little stories are stories of just what I have seen. Um, other teachers have shared with me, and Ms. Claus being one, she had a student who struggled academically. Artistically, he was amazing. So on her um, days where she would have her finish it Fridays where they would start a drawing or there were some other ideas that she had, he was the spotlight. Everybody wanted to see him, so even though he struggled, that was his time for him to shine. Um, relationships with everyone in the classroom are stronger, and that includes with the teacher, because we're not always up front giving instruction. We're sitting with them, and we're laughing, and we're singing, and we're messing up on songs, because I tend to do that. And we're trying to get everything in so they see that human side of the teacher. And as far as the relationships with each other, those relationships develop. And people who never knew they had things in common start becoming really good friends and helping one another out. So, hey, I'm stuck on math. Well, I know you well enough because I worked with you through morning meeting. I'm going to give you a hand. And um, it's a fun time. Everybody has a good time during morning meeting. Everybody participates. What they learn in that time is more beneficial to our students than their recess time and things like that because they're learning those pieces of interacting and helping one another. At this time, we are going to let the children share with you their thoughts. So here we have Avery. And we asked Avery, what's your favorite part of morning meeting? Passing around the stuffed animals, saying hello to our friends in different languages, having toys to pass around, and greeting each other. Here we have Vivia. Vivia, what's your favorite part of morning meeting? Our favorite part of morning meetings is learning about others, sharing our, sharing our feelings. That way, if someone is sad, we can help them feel better. Everyone listens to each other, having a good greeting and sometimes a good laugh. <laughs> Learning about people and begin, beginning comfortable together. And Kayo, what's something you learned from morning meeting? Some things we learn from morning meeting are how to speak in different languages, how to talk kindly to our friends, and and how to be respectful to each other and the names of everyone in our classroom. 
Gideon, what's something you learned from morning meeting? Something we learned from morning meeting is it's easy to make friends. School is a lot more fun than you think. Learning to listen to someone without talking to another person. Learning more about our classmates. And Caitlin, what do you like about morning meetings? I like about morning meetings. We like morning meetings because we get to see what we are passing around the circle. We like to use different languages. It's fun. We get to have we get to hang out with our friends. We get to hear what our other what our friends have to did and learn about them. We get to help our friends. We learn fun songs. Nayel, what do you like about morning meeting? You get, I mean, can hear how people feel and what their opinions are. You get to spend time with your teacher and class all together. You learn interesting things about people, and it's all, it's all, it's a time we gather and have fun with our classroom family. And Cole, what are some expectations of morning meeting? Oh, Jacob, I'm sorry. What are some expectations of morning meeting? When we speak, we use a loud and proud voice, speak in a complete sentences, and we look at our classmates when speaking. And Cole, what are some of your expectations? The expectations of morning meeting are looking at the person who is speaking, listen to the speaker, greet each other by name. And finally, we asked the students how they felt during morning meeting. So how do you feel during morning meeting? I feel happy during morning meeting because we sing songs. I feel calm because I can listen to others. I feel happy to, uh, I feel excited during morning meeting because we get to do different things each day. I feel like it's a good way to start the day um, because it's fun. I feel happy during morning meetings because I'm spending time with my friends. I feel excited because we get to talk to each other. I feel good during morning meeting because we get to um, have fun. I'm not nervous because we, we get to know our friends. I feel happy because I like to talk to the class. Boys and girls, thank you. Mrs. Robinson, Ms. Claus, thank you for sharing. Um, school board, we hope that you've enjoyed our presentation tonight. Did you have any questions for us? Do all the classes do this, or is it just yes. someone? Yes. It does, OK. Yeah, all, all right. of our classrooms. And this is your second year doing mm -hmm. this? OK. Yes. Thank you. Thank you again. Well, I don't have any questions, but um, anybody who's watched me know that this is a big soft spot of mine. Uh, first of all, having the kids the, the, to come here, and thank you for the parents who brought them here tonight. Um, their, your children's performance was exemplary, sitting here for half an hour and is so well behaved, speaking so clearly, having such great things to say. It's obviously a great program that they all enjoy, and we're, we're seeing the benefits both anecdotally and you know th how well they behaved here tonight. Thank you very much for bringing them here and, and for sharing with us. I think it's extraordinary thank you very much uh, for those who participated and uh, I do actually owe everybody sort of an apology because uh, we blipped right over the public comment section um, that was uh, item three on our agenda and I, and I apologize for that so if you were here to speak and uh, uh, wanted to get out after a roll call I, I missed calling on you so 
I, we didn't have any comments, so we didn't have any cards, so you know, I don't feel really bad, but we'll try again. Did anybody want to have any public comments before we go to the next item on the agenda? Okay, so hearing none, we'll go back in order to the next thing, which is the approval of minutes. Okay, moving to uh, item number five, approval of the minutes, 5.1 where we recommend the board to approve the monthly board action minutes for August 13th, 2019. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from August 13th. Do we have any questions on the minutes for the motion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed say no. This order without objection. Moving on to item 5.2, the monthly board minutes for August 27th. We're asking the board to approve the monthly board actions for August 27th as submitted. We have a motion and a second from, uh, uh, as presented, does anybody have any questions on the board minutes for August 27th? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed say no. So ordered without objection. I move that we accept the high school accounts, middle school accounts, and cafeteria accounts as presented. There's a tie over there. Huh? <laughs> we have a motion from Mr. Hutt and a second uh, from Ms. Custer. Uh, does anybody have any questions on the receiving the accounts? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. So ordered without objection. I move that we approve the payments of invoices in the amount of $7,268,968.04 for August 2019 as presented. We have a motion and a second for the granting of the orders. Does anybody have any question? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say no. So ordered without objection. I move that we approve the treasurer's report for August 2019 as presented and file it for audit. We have a motion and a second on the treasurer to approve the treasurer's report. Uh, do we have any questions on the treasurer's report? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed say no. So ordered without objection. Uh, moving on to the report of the superintendent, uh, before we move forward with our student board rep report, I'd like to call up Mr. Gary Dorenzo, our Director of Community Relations and Co-Curricular Activities, uh, to introduce our newest student board member. Uh, good evening. First, I'd like to say, first of all, to Brenna, we never properly introduced you last year, and you did a phenomenal job as our student board rep, so... Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you back, and you're going to serve as, uh, as uh, Maddie's mentor this year, but you did an outstanding job, and um, it's, uh, this program has continued to be upgraded by the quality of, of, of your students, and, and so we thank you. So um, on to our new, newest board member, rep student board rep member, is junior Maddie Palmer. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. She is... Uh, Involved in the marching band, the concert band, the jazz band. They have practice right now, so she's here with us. She's a member of the DECA program. Um, she's attended the prestigious Hobie Leadership Conference last year. She also teaches Sunday school and kids camp in her spare time. And you can find her when she's not providing services to others as a hostess at Red Lobster. Both of her parents are in the healthcare uh, industry, and um, she plans to follow her mother's footsteps and become a nurse when she's um, done Pottsgrove and, and on to college. Uh, I want to add one little thing that I think is uh, very noteworthy. She created her own organization to support diabetes, and in the past seven years, each year, she's raised over $1,000 um, for that service. So again. Uh, I think we have two outstanding, articulate young ladies, and I think they provide a wonderful service to the board and to, vault, to all of us. And um, that's Maddie Palmer, our junior board rep. So. 
And without any further delay, uh, I would like to, to, to present uh, Brenna and uh, Madison for our updates. So all around the Posture School District, we had a successful first days throughout all the schools. The high school did something different this year. We had a pep rally on the first day, which most students seemed to enjoy themselves. Um, Lower had their back to school nights on the third, fourth, and fifth. Ringing Rocks had theirs last night with multiple National Honor Society students volunteering to help provide child care so these parents could attend. Uh, we went to the middle school today for Falcon feedback session, which we will focus our report on next time. We decided to talk to some of the students taking French this year to see how they thought the program was running. So we asked them, what do you think of the class, and do you think this was a worthwhile addition to Pottsgrove? The first student we talked to was Victoria. She's a freshman. We asked her, what do you think of the class, and she said, I like the class because it is something different that I haven't tried before. For the second question, she responded, I think it was a good addition to Pottsgrove, as this is my first year taking a language. I had no interest in taking Spanish or German, but this sparked my interest. The second student we talked to was a junior. His name is Mark. We asked him, what do you think of the class? And he said, I really enjoy the class. I find myself getting a lot out of it. We asked him if it was a worthwhile addition, and he said, yes, keep French. This is by far one of the better classes I have taken in a while. I really enjoy the addition of this class. It's new, it's different, and it's fun. We were able to talk to one middle schooler and get her thoughts on taking French as a seventh grader with no other language experience. We asked her, what do you think of the class? And she said, I like it. I think that the videos we watch are very educational and the stuff that she tells us to study is very helpful. We asked her if she thought it was a worthwhile addition and she said, yeah, I didn't really want to take Spanish or German, so I was excited that there was something else to try. Any, any questions from any board members? Uh, on the report. Very good. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Moving on to item 10, discussion items. Uh, tonight, we'd like to uh, welcome uh, Ms. Kate Pacito and Dr. Cantor to come forward and to talk with us uh, about uh, our Read 180, Read 180 excuse me, intervention program and uh, how the growth that we achieved in that as well as our future focus of uh, implementations. Dr. Cantor. Thank you, Dr. Shirk. Uh, thank you, board members, too, because we know as a department we come and ask you to spend money, and we hope we're asking you to spend that money in the right place. So we wanted to present you some information to let you know that you are doing what's right by our students. It's truly been my privilege to work with the students in this district for the last three years and the beginning of the fourth year. One of the things that Ms. Pasito and I have a goal, as a goal is to be the exemplar special ed program, program excuse me, in Montgomery County. So I just want to take you one step for, back before I get to why Read 180. And when Mrs. Pasito and I work together, we look at special education maybe in a different manner than most other districts. We don't look at special education as that placement over there. We see special education as a level of support. How do we support our students? Because when our students attend this school district, they come here as Potsgrove School District students. Our goal is to provide the additional support and services they need to help them have access to the general education. That brings me to my next slide. Now we know Mr. Voris did a phenomenal job going out and working with the teachers to bring in new curriculum, rigor of new curriculum in math, ELA, and science. And if we look at block number one, if every student was able to learn in the same exact manner, then that curriculum would be fine. But what we found out through, you know, through special education services and evaluations, some students may need a different level of support. That's where box number two comes in. So box number two is us in special education providing those additional supports and services for our students so they could have equal access to the district curriculum. But we want to take it one step further. Our ultimate goal under Ms. Pasito and I's direction is to knock down those barriers. We don't see special education as a life commitment, but a fluid document. And if we look at box number three, if we can remove those barriers through intervention programs like Read 180 and future programs like Math 180, we see our students be successful with their general education peers.
and how does that impact the district? So we look at the district. We currently start the school year off. We have 605 students who have needs-based IEPs that we're responsible for. So at our current trajectory, that's 18.5% of the district. So if we look at making impact on our school district, our success, our PSSA scores, if we can impact 18.5% of our school district, think about the global impact that we'll have on our school district as a whole. That doesn't take into account our gifted IEPs, which are another 220 students and 119 other students who have 504 plans. So you see how this multiplies out. So we're almost over 1,000 students that receive special education supports and services. And actually mirroring Mr. Boer's model, we actually did this with the teachers from a grassroots up and not from a top-down approach. So we looked at the middle school and we looked at our special education teachers who are working in ELA and Ms. Cook who works in our middle school in our 6th, 7th, and 8th grade ELA department. We looked at what type of intervention would be most effective in meeting the needs of our, most, our, our kids in ELA. And what we did is we reviewed five different programs we narrowed it down to three. We brought the representatives in from those three programs and narrowed it down to Read 180. We only began Read 180 last October. We started with 41 students in the program. And if we look at the data, out of those 41 students, we have 39% of our students. Now, keep in mind, we're, we're talking with students with identified needs and difficulties who made one year's progress. We're looking at 22% of the students in that program who demonstrated two years growth or progress, and 20% of the students who demonstrated what they call career readiness, which means if they follow the same trajectory, they will be prepared to go to college or trade school when they graduate from high school. So that's only beginning in October, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So are you saying that's cumulative, that's 81%? Yes. Of the 41 students, 81%? Have made growth at that magnitude. That's amazing, thank you. You're welcome, my pleasure. And you can stop me anytime you want. I'm a very calisthenic learner, so me sitting here, is, is, I'm not used to it. <laughs> so when we looked at the overall success, we said, what can we do better? So one of the things that we realized is that, one is we didn't start the program until October. That was one thing. Two is that based on the current schedule in the middle school, we were only able to implement the program three days a week for sixth and seventh graders and two days a week, oh, I'm sorry, cycle for eighth graders. We want, to mag we want to magnify that. So working with Mr. Boyer, we were able to rearrange the encore schedules. So now all students who are a part of Read 180 will receive the programming four days per cycle. So one, we're starting in August. Two is that we're increasing the um, magnitude of this, the, the program. And we're hoping that leads us to more improve gains as we move forward. The success of this program led us to look at Math 180, because we recognize math at the middle school is another area of need. We did the same exact programming. We met with four of the math teachers in the middle school. We evaluated five programs, went to three, brought in the, the reps, narrowed it down to Math 180, and we began Math 180 this August. Questions? Can you explain the 20% uh, demonstrated growth at the college career level a little more? When I first read that, I thought 20% are already on college level, but I don't think that's what you mean. So 39% had one year's growth, 22% two years. So what's the 20%? So in, in the Read 180 program, we're using Lexile levels. So Lexile levels work on projected trajectory of where the students would be. So they're looking at that growth, and if they extrapolate that out to students who can maintain that growth or continue to grow at that level, by the time they get to 12th grade, they'll be ready for college. Make any more, does it make sense? So is it safe to say 20% made more than? More than two, two years ago. Yes. Okay. And I had a question on Math 180. You answered it. Very happy to hear your answer. Um, <clears throat> My other question is, so you're talking about middle school. I don't imagine they come in sixth grade and suddenly drop two years. What, what have we looked at at the elementary level? Is there, would this fit at the elementary level too in the, the upper grades where we already see kids are falling behind instead of waiting to middle school? 
one thing that we found out through the whole entire process is what we use for the middle school may not work at the elementary level. Like we tried originally to do a K through eight model, and we found that there was different needs based on the different levels. So we started with the middle school because the middle school, their title services end in fifth grade. So the middle school no longer has title services either. So we fit that would be the best place for a pilot program. The other thing about interventions is interventions should only be a two to three year age span. And if they don't work, then we're not using the right intervention. So with the success of RE180, our goal will be to be backward design, start looking how do we get them up to level before they get to the middle school. So it's a great question, and that's probably our next steps as well, too. Am I correct? Math 180 has already started. Math 180 has started, yes. How many kids are in Math 180? 85. 85? Yes. How many boys, how many girls? That I do not know, but I can look that up for you and get you that answer. Because if you're tough focusing on middle schools, middle school is when female students tend to move away from math and science. And that's, that's, an, that's an interesting trend that is, you know, I think is universal. Yes, but I will give you those numbers. Yeah. Thank you. And once again, I thank just you for your support. I want to say one thing real quick. Um, sure. I am thrilled that we are actually recognizing um, the achievements of our students with special needs um, and, and need to help. And I applaud both of you for what you do with all your teams to help our students that need that assistance. Thank you very much. And we're delighted that working with Mr. Dorenzo and the AD from the district right on Friday, we're gonna acknowledge our students who participated in the Special Olympics. They're gonna be acknowledged before Friday's football game. They're gonna come out through the tunnel, they'll have their names read individually, and we're excited to have it. So far we have 17 parents and families who've committed to come on Saturday. I mean Friday, I'm sorry, Friday. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cantor. Moving on to action items for personnel. I'd like to make a motion that we approve number 11 action items for personnel. From 11 1 to 11 5. Uh, well, she made the motion 11 1 through 11 5. And we'll Put you down, Mr. Hudders, making the second. Okay. 11 1 through 11 5 is motion and seconded. Uh, does anybody have any questions on 11 1 through 11 5? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. So ordered without objection. Moving on to action items for business, tuition agreement for Lakeside. The recommendation from administration is to authorize and enter into a special education services and tuition agreement. For one student at Lakeside Upper Marion Vantage Academy for the amount of $302.50 per day, which would equal $54,450. We have a motion and a second on, action, on tuition agreement 12.1. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. And so ordered without objection. Moving on to 12.2. Like we have a motion and a second on 12.2 and to wish we went with uh, new story. Does anybody have any questions or comments on 12.2? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say no. So ordered without objection. Moving on to 12.3, the GPS tracking system. We're asking the board to approve the purchase of a GPS tracking system from Eagle Wireless for the district's transportation fleet as presented. We have a motion and a second on the GPS tracking system. Does anybody have any questions or comments on this? I have one question. Sure. You were able to, they were able to bring the bill down a couple thousand dollars. Was that just a sharpening of the pencil, or did we have to give up some level of service for that? No, I think they were very interested in gaining us as a client, and uh, they were willing to go below what their normal, normal operating margins would be. Okay. 
Are there any questions? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say no. And so ordered without objection. Okay, does anybody have any questions on 12.4, the Brandywine Virtual Academy? Yeah, I'm just curious, um, why the increase? Um, but that's my question. Uh, the Brandywine Virtual Academy is operated by, through the Chester County Intermediate Unit. Um, they are faced with the same type of cost increases that we have, uh, pension increases, uh, salary increases, et cetera, and that would have all played into the, to the, to the tuition rates. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I take it the MCIU doesn't have a similar program? Correct. I do have one more question. Um, so it's stating here that it's $666 a credit. Um, and I know this is uh, the, one of the most cost effective um, cyber schools, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, what's an average cost for the other ones that seem to have a ton of extra money because they're advertising constantly on TV? I, I wish Pottsgrove could make a um, film a commercial you know, had that kind of money. But I'm just curious, what what is, is it 800, is it 1,000, is it? The, uh, the other cyber schools do not uh, quantify on a uh, cr per credit basis, but the cost of a student attending uh, a cyber or brick and mortar charter school, a regular ed student is about $14,200 for this year and over $30,000 uh, for a special education student. And what is, uh, aren't we at about 12,000 per student here? Am I incorrect? Like, if, is it less, more? One credit, one, one credit is one class. No, 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 I'm saying when we, when we, um, you know, take all the numbers and, and figure out how much approximately we're spending per student, we spend per student within the Pottsgrove School District. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's that number. Is that, I'm just saying, I'm just wondering how it compares to these cyber schools, because that's. The, the that's cyber school tuition is based um, on what the cost of the district has for, for their education. Uh, there are some adjustments, they take out some things for, um, duplicated services like special ed would be removed for special education purposes and uh, infrastructure debt service things like that are pulled out <clears throat> but for it's it's an estimate of what we spend is the tuition rate for the the charter schools that's why <clears throat> more expensive or districts that pay more uh, have a higher uh, tuition rate if you were in lower Marion you would pay more would, Lower Marion would pay more than Potts Grove does, and a poorer district or a district that pays less uh, per student would pay less. So the, the, I don't want to say our tuition rate is fourteen thousand two hundred dollars, but that's what that tuition rate is supposed to approximate. I can get the state the state calculation for you. I don't have that at my fingertips. I, I don't need that. I was just curious what the how the costs compared, because I just know how much money we spend on on cyber school, and I don't think too many people, other than the nine of us board members sitting here and the administrators, have any idea how much money not only our district but other districts throughout the state spend on cyber school, and you know everyone. Um, would like to see some changes in um, school taxes and you know all that stuff but when you add in that schools like ours are spending in the millions for cyber school maybe that'll open some eyes 
um, because, you know, on TV it's free. It's no charge. It's, you know, well, there is a charge. And it comes out of each and every one of our pockets every August or September or um, October, whenever you're paying your bill. So just wanted to put that out there. Mrs. Custer brings up an interesting point. <clears throat> and like she said, we see the charter schools on the TVs all the time advertising. We don't see Brandywine Virtual Academy. Of course, the funds aren't there. Would it be to ours and other districts that are involved with the Virtual Academy uh, to our mutual benefit to connect and see, hey, what would it cost to kind of split the cost between, I don't know how many schools are a part of Virtual Academy, Brandywine Virtual Academy, um, to see if that's even something that's worthwhile to kind of go in together with other districts and make it more publicly known. Yeah, I think there's a strong case to be made for us to explore getting the word out about the presence of this virtual academy, because certainly it's not the Brandywine Virtual Academy doesn't have the name recognition that the uh, ones that we've seen on local TV advertise. Uh, so I think our public school system just the whole public school system here is one of the best kept secrets in Montgomery County. We've got a very excellent schools district. We've got a very excellent program, which we just heard about, uh, Act 180, or uh, Read 180, and uh, Math 180. And beyond this room, it's virtually unknown. I, I think much can be said for letting the general public become aware of things like our cyber school and our own program. And I think that's the point that you're hitting on and you're hitting on, and I think that's the point where we need to get the word out about public, sco about public schools vis-a-vis, -vis, oh gee, there's this free thing that I can get and the word is on free, and yeah, uh, we need to let people know that the existing system works. And I think that's what uh, Ashley's talking about, and I think that's what Bill's talking about, and I think that's where we need, what we need to explore is how to get the general community aware of the good things that are going on in their schools other than the fact that every year I have to write a large check. And since my last kid graduated in 1999, that large tech check is a pain. So let them know about the good things that are going on here. And we need to explore that with uh, people who do that exploration, uh, who do that, the marketing people who prepared that TV ad and who know how to reach the people in our community. That's We've got comment. a couple of different ways that we can go about this. Um, we, could, we could have this discussion now during the action items. We could bring it up again under new business. I think that might be one way to go, new business. Um, because what we want to talk about is we can introduce sort of structural plans, and I think maybe do, you might have some ideas on this, Dr. Shirk, um, in terms of we, we collectively have sort of discussed, you know, in sort of side discussions, you know, having a marketing firm to, to, to talk about things, and we've talked about there might be a cost associated with that. Do we want to do that or not? And that's a discussion we, we have to have. Um, or do we want to have it done here? Do we want, is this something that we want to have the, uh, that we want to have <clears throat> done in-house? Do we want to basically put out questionnaires? Do we want to have advertising? How do we want to do that? And that's a discussion we can take through the facility, you know, through committee committee work. I think it's, it's discussions we need to have. And if we want to hold that over for the new business portion, I think that, that'll, that'll
that'll work. We'll just finish up here with the cyber charter thing, finish out with the action work, go into the new new business work, if that's all right with everybody. Yeah? Yeah. Because I think you had some things you were going to say about that? No, it, it, I have some uh, thoughts for new business, so I was just waiting till new business uh, separate from this piece. Yeah. Okay. So a motion and a second. We had some questions. And are there any other questions on the on the Brandywine Virtual Academy? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. All those opposed say no. Okay. Sorry, I just like to finish up what we're on and moving on to the next thing. Uh, okay. Education. Yep. Action items for education. Uh, Thirteen point one. Thirteen one to thirteen seven, right? Yes, I'm sorry. Does anybody have any exceptions? Does everybody have any questions on thirteen one to thirteen seven? If not, all those in favor of thirteen one to thirteen seven say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Sword without objection. Okay, that moves us to uh, Mrs. Grimm and an update from the JOC. Yes, we had a great meeting last night. Um, it's, it's always good meetings over there. Um, the beginning, they, they talked about the great opening day they had. They had a guest speaker, Brooke Harper. He's an author, a speaker, and a coach who gave a motivational speech, uh, Seven Skills, to, do the Western, to the Western students and staff, and it was well received. Brooks believes that every young person has a powerful story to tell, and people need to hear it. The ability for students to articulate, stand, and deliver their message in front of their audiences is invaluable and essential to their development. Some of the key points that he brought was turn learning into earnings. Why should we hire you? Students are actually interviewing for their careers every day. Skills to make mills. Stretch themselves to achieve excellence in high school and beyond. Connect the dots between today's choices and tomorrow's options. Helping students get it, providing greater understanding of how education and personal development play key roles in the formula of their success, increasing self-worth, motivation, and performance. So with that starting off your day, the kids are going to have a great year, and the staff will too. So I was really glad to hear that. Um, we moved on, and we recognized and applauded State Representative Joe Cerisi for securing a PA leg grant um, in the amount of $40,000 for the Western Center. We approved using some of the monies last night for supplemental automotive cluster instructors for adult automotive training classes and a single mother's program. The Western Center understands that there have been some financial obstacles to get the students in their co-op jobs. Basically, they just can't get from point A to point B. So with this grant, um, we also, are, we were hot, we're using some of the money to hire two part-time education drivers to provide transportation for the students to local business and industries locations for the purpose of increasing our co-op placements. Um, Western Center will be offering fall automotive classes for state certification. This will be open to students and public, which is including PA state inspections. Um, the, the dates are coming up in September, and PA admissions will be held in October. Uh, there is a fee, and please contact the Western Center for the details. What did come up last night is we train the kids how to do emissions, but they cannot do emissions. Um, there's just so much involved, so they do mock emissions, so at least the kids are learning how to do it. Um, they're in the process of NOCTI pre-testing for our freshman class. We do have about 604 students, I believe, now, which, again, when I started this, we were in, you know, the, the low 400s, so we're really growing. Uh, the Western Center will be hosting for the second year of Boy Scout Merit Badge College. That'll be October 19th. Last year was the first year with under 20 scouts, and this year there's over 100. And this will be the second year a, a, a cl club coming up from Virginia. And basically what these programs are to get some of these merit badges that they cannot, they're really hard to get, whether it's plumbing, um, mechanical, they're really hard for the students to attain them. So this college actually helps these students 
go further with their uh, merit badges. Um, upcoming events, we're gonna have our first community dinner. Tickets are going fast. It's our Thanksgiving feast. That'll be uh, Monday, November 4th. We're gonna have our fourth annual girls' night out on uh, November 14th. And this night out is basically showing all of our female uh, students that they can get into the trades, what we offer. And this will be the first year that they'll experience the welding program that we um, started this year. Open house, which is our back to school night, will be held December 11th, 2019. Thank you, Mrs. Graham. Appreciate it. Mr. Ling, we're gonna move on to new business. We're just like that, just like that, we're back to new business, so. Funny how that works. If you don't mind, I'd like to start. Please. Thank you. Um, he didn't say brief tonight. I, I didn't make him say brief tonight. I would, I I'm, I'm going to be brief. I have a, um, first of all, I would like to invite the board. We had an opportunity. I know uh, Mr. Voris and Mrs. Custer had an opportunity to speak, and I know that the board, we have talked about this over the last several months, uh, about uh, updating the board on our, our, uh, our ACRA analytics and how we use all of our testing assessments and how we roll that into one package. So well, we're inviting the whole board next Tuesday, uh, the 17th, to come to our uh, Curriculum Technology Integration Committee meeting to really have an in-depth workshop on how we go from testing to the analytics to the district office, how we break it down at the district office level, how that then moves to the principals and the building leadership, and then how that works its way to the teachers, and then ultimately to our students and how we make those real-time decisions. So um, we've had the opportunity to have rec for now going on three years, uh, and I really I think it's, it's important that you get refreshed on that and have an understanding of how we do use it um, you know, throughout the year uh, to make these decisions. So that'll take place next uh, Tuesday, so I wanna invite everybody to that. We'll send out a reminder, but I wanted to uh, invite you personally to that. Uh, also, I wanted to let you know that uh, what we are planning on doing is starting exploratory work to upgrade our website and combine that upgrade with an app. What we found out in our recent registrations over the years, a lot of our parents don't have personal computers, but they have phones. And we need to try to, um, if you will, mesh those to our website and our information so that it's really applicable for a smartphone. And I think that that will help us in a lot of different ways uh, as we move forward. Um, obviously, there's a cost to that. There's not a cost to investigating it, but there's going to be a cost to upgrade that. Our last upgrade was 2012. And uh, over the summer when we've had our administrative retreats and having a chance to talk with our tech team, we feel it's time to explore those pieces to our website, make it more user friendly. We've talked about the marketing pieces. We talked about how to navigate, uh, and I just wanted to let you know that we're gonna start that process and we'll be updating you as, uh, frequently as, as, we, as we work through that. And finally, we were gonna really circle back to, um, and I was gonna ask you to do homework, actually, so you, you, brought it to, you brought it to the table, but I was gonna ask you to really give us some direction on next steps regarding our charter, the charter school. Uh, we, we sort of left the year in June talking about it, uh, and, um, I'd really, I'd really like to, 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 get, to get some direction on how you want this to proceed. I do feel that we have the in-house capability of putting structures in place, some marketing uh, systems in place, if you will, along with personal touches, uh, along with uh, uh, cyber touches, if you will, with emails and so forth. Uh, I do believe we have that capability and we could do that and, inst and institute that fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, some of the board members had talked to me over the summer regarding using focus groups to really go out in the community and to find out why, you know, uh, people, why, our, why our community chooses to do cyber school or brick and mortar uh, schools as well. So um, we're, we're, uh, we're up for the challenge. Uh, obviously, there would be a cost associated with different paths that we take. Uh, I do feel ultimately we do our due diligence um, with this process, what I would like to see, because you've heard me say this numerous of times, and, and so is my, my staff and leadership, is that we, don't, we do things, but we do things in isolation. I want to bring things into a structure so that every year, and I have the folder with me, I know exactly what students are in brick and mortar, I know exactly what students are in cyber, and then we can put our check boxes of 
how many touches that we, we do, what kind of communications that we do. And when the board asks a question about how many students are in cyber school, I can say, yes, 55. How many in brick and mortar? 25. Here's the dollar amount being spent. Here's what we do on a yearly basis to, in our K-2 division, our 3-5 division, our middle school and our high schools, uh, so that when you do ask those questions, we, we can tell you, uh, you know, and check our boxes and let you know those pieces. When it comes to the focus group piece, that would definitely be a lot, that'd be a different piece for us. Uh, we don't have that in-house expertise to do that. Uh, we would want that to be, um, you know, taken by a group that understands that process and has done that in the past. So if you, I'm interested in discussion tonight. I don't think we have to make any real quick decisions. If you want to think about it, we can come back and put it on the docket again for, for next, at the end of the month. But I really would like you to think about so that we can have some direction moving forward. Thank you. Dr. Shirk, I agree with, uh, <clears throat> my initial feeling is I agree with your comment that um, it is uh, something, at least with what I'm thinking about in regards to charter school research and why people are leaving and how can we get them back if, if we can, is that it can be done in-house. Um, I don't initially support a uh, focus group type thing, although I'm open to the discussion. Um, so I guess the question is, uh, Mr. President, do we want to have the discussion tonight or is this something we want to come back to a workshop and have a more in-depth time to present thoughts and, I don't know. It's 8.30, man. It's very early. I don't know. Is it? <laughs> and just at, at a minimum, we're, we're going to start to structure process. We're going to do that. I mean, that, that, that ball is going to be rolling, you know, shortly uh, to, to put those structural pieces in place and, and, and to have a checklist, if you will, on a yearly basis, you know, fall, fall, winter, spring, summer type piece. So that ball will be, will be rolling. It's just the next, the next piece. So we can have that discussion tonight. Uh, we can have it next, next time. We can have a separate individual workshop to do that. But I think the first thing, and I've, I've learned this from Mr. Langworth, I mean, if, 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 we have, if we have five people interested, then that's one thing, okay? If we don't, then that's, that's another because, uh, you know, we have a lot of people doing a lot of things administratively, and it, I don't want to take anybody away from doing the day-to-day -day piece. So I'd be more than happy to do it, but I would, I would want the support of the majority of the board to, to move it forward. I, th focus, I think focus group piece. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a good idea, and I'd, I'm interested in seeing it fall through just to see where it takes us. Has, I can't believe that we're the only district thinking this uh, in the county or let alone the state or, you know, national. Um, has there been any thought given, have you reached out to any other school districts? I mean, I, I understand that any sort of focus group, if that was what was decided, would have to be unique to us, but there could be a foundation, you know, some if you know X number of school districts were interested in doing this, there might be some sort of cost savings to doing that, even though they'd be doing it slightly different. But there must be others out there that have looked into this. So I don't know if you found any yet, or any you know stumbled upon them, or have sought them out. I have a suggestion. Um, is there any way we could reach out to PSBA because that's the state? Um, school board and I know this has been a hot topic with them and it's not just our little local area it's statewide so um, PSBA may really be a good tool for us um, to contact uh, def definitely mrs. Graham that would be one one option uh, for us to to investigate um, this week I do have a meeting of the Montgomery County superintendents uh, we, we float we float those ideas and around you know every month you know, and that's something we, I could definitely bring up. And uh, the first question would be, you know, how many, how many of you have done it first? And then second, would anybody else be interested in it? I know, I know uh, uh, that was one of the things that we wanted to look at, uh, you know, on the, uh, as far as our check, we just wanted to see who's, who's done some of these pieces before. So we, we needed to, to, to uh, educate ourselves on that piece to see uh, those pieces. We do know there's structural models out there. There are school districts that have models in place. It's not a total reinvent the wheel. We'd have to, you know, uh, customize it to Pottsgrove, uh, but we feel that those structures are out there. We just have to pick the best fit, fit for us. But obviously Montgomery County, Chester County, uh, as well as PSBA are definitely areas we can reach for uh, conversation. 
I think that sounds like a great idea. Uh, myself, what my interests are <clears throat> is, you know, do you, i.e. other districts, have anything in place where, I don't know that how this would be possible, but to uh, interact, to reach out to those that are thinking about leaving, do you have something in place to reach out and find out why people have left? Do you have something in place for families moving in that are already in charter to reach out to them? Those are just, I'm speaking for myself, mm -hmm. but my three uh, interests for other sure. districts. Right. Just to kind of piggyback, piggyback off that, do we have like any stats off the last four or five years off of how many students, like what trend is this going in? How severe of this is a problem? We, so we I know the costs are going up. I'm just wondering about numbers exactly with them. Yeah, I, we, we, we do have that information. And that, that's really why I want that structure in place because we, I want to be able to say to the board, in 2013, 14, here's where our number, 2000, you know, but again, if we, depending on our numbers of special education, we, if we have a special education year, we double our cost, you know, uh, with those particular things. So that's really what I want to, that's the, that's the pieces that we can do for you, you know, right, right away, where we can have a yearly, <clears throat> a yearly piece, and we'll have to see logistically how far back we can go to be able to paint the picture. Uh, I, I think we can go back a couple years you know, I don't know if we can go back five. five. I, I'll have to, you know, talk to, you know, our data people to see how far we can go back and what kind of information we can get. But I think that those pieces, along with asking the questions along the way, uh, the, those pieces we, we, can, we can get, yep, oh, within, our, within our current system. Scott, if this gives you any kind of idea on um, how the numbers have grown over the years, I obviously don't have data in front of me, but I was at, I was in attendance of um, one of the meetings where they were, um, they were talking about bringing in the computers and starting a one-to-one -one, one -one program. And uh, I remember somebody, I don't, I don't Bob, you weren't on, I, I think that was the time when you were not on the board, but I remember, um, somebody in the administration standing up and saying, well, we feel that by giving every student a computer, we'll be bringing students back who have left for cyber school. So if we bring back, I think I wanna say it was like 12, something along those lines. We bring 12 back, which was like half at that time, half of the kids that were in cyber school, we will almost pay for the, the computers will almost pay for themselves. Now we're looking at millions. So at the time it was like $300,000. So that just goes to show how it has snowballed in the last, and they, they brought the computers in. Huh. Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what year, but yeah. Nothing's free. By the way, they didn't pay for themselves. They didn't. They're still not. So I think that the, what the board does have consensus on is, yes, we do want to move forward with structures. We do want, we do want ongoing reporting of, of basically what the trends are, what's happening. Um, you know, are, are we seeing increases, decreases, what's going on? Part of that reporting is going to be um, the increased focus on truancies, who's in the district, who's, you know, what's happening with the, um, because as we had more attention to the truancy and who was in the reporting on that, who's living in the district and who's not and whatnot, that certainly had an effect on it as well. Um, because as there was more enforcement, we had more people that were taking advantage of the, the cyber school option, mm -hmm. uh, where that's not looked at as much. So, so that was, that was part of it as well. And I think there may well be just some more discussion. I guess we're, get, we're gonna kick the, the can down the road okay. on whether or not to do a focus group. Okay. Maybe we'll bring that back for more discussion. Maybe we'll look at, it, at that in some of the committees. Um, going back to the earlier discussion items, um, I want to extend the invitation to next Tuesday's meeting to our school board representatives to join us for that exciting and just 
exhilarating meeting that we're going to have on ECRA where you'll learn if, you, if you've already taken statistics, this will be an opportunity for you to put that into practice, just to see it in living color like you've never seen it before. Um, so if you'd like to attend, feel free to join us as a committee of the whole. Um, so there's that. And the other thing I would like to emphasize is what we talked about on the website. So if we're going to be making a change to the website and making it so that it works you know, on the phone, uh, on, on the phones, that there is a cost involved. We're talking spending new money, new money to update the website. Um, so that would be a cost that's not currently in the budget. Um, so that'd be a new thing, new dollars for a new upgraded website. So just want to make sure that that's pointed out now so it's not a surprise come February when we talk about the budget. Because believe it or not, in our facilities committee, he had the audacity to throw a new budget schedule, a uh, new budget uh, calendar in front of us. So we're already talking about the budget calendar for next year. So there's that. Sir. I'll just say whenever I brought up about website issues, I'm not thinking complete overhaul. I, I mean, with, with the limited information I have right now, I certainly don't support uh, going out and replacing or, you know, spending money on what we have. I think we have enough people here uh, involved with the web system, uh, with the Internet and the web page <clears throat> to make some updates, to keep things updated. And personally, I would be happy. So. I, for one, don't support going out and spending money we, on this. We knew that would be your position. <laughs> we anticipated that. Can, can we, if we're going to go spend money, can we have a longer discussion and, and, and have a vote? I, I don't know. The, and hear why there, it's there, necessary? I'm, I'm telling you, this is the proposed idea. This is what he's talking about. This is where we're headed. Um, it's not being presented as a thing that's done. It's, he's talking about this is what he's looking at. I'm letting you know there would be a cost associated with it if it goes forward. It is not an agenda item right now. It is a new business discussion item. Right. Uh, Mr. Parker, I, I have my notes right here. Starting exploratory work. There you go. I don't, that's, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that uh, you would expect from somebody in this position is to constantly be looking forward. On, on, on whether whether it's curriculum or instruction or whether it's technology or whether it's infrastructure. Um, so um, one of the things that came out of our administrative workshops this summer was the, the clunkiness of our system because we have a lot of people that, that work in it and also the fact that uh, our clients, our community, um, a lot of them don't have the, the personal computer but they have smartphones. That's where they invest their money. And we're, we're, we're looking at tying those two together so that when you click on our website and you need to register a student or you need to a form to fill out, you have that ability. Now, I have no idea what that costs. I have no idea what the integration pieces are to that. But I thought the due diligence piece for us would be to look at it. And, I, and, and two months from now, I might say, oh, boy, we're we're way over our head. I would not recommend that. So I, I think it's a due diligence piece on my part and really listening to my administrators who work in the system uh, and our support staff who works in the system and our tech director uh, to at least look, look at it. So that, that's the why. Uh, and the word is exploratory work. And um, that's, you know, I can't even tell you if I'm in a position. I won't even be in a position. I'll give you a board update when I can even talk about it again because I'm talking to you first. So, thank you. And my position on that is nothing's free. That's that's all I'm saying. Is if if that goes forward, if he says yes, we're going to do something, nothing's free. That's all I'm saying. I don't think we can get any improvement for free. But we can keep our website updated. We don't have to have teachers' web pages with information from 2014. That is free. That and is, that's that, any yes. comments I've made on the that's web page. Correct. I'm not saying there isn't other, other issues. I'm just speaking from my concerns with the web page. Yes. That should be free. Yes. And it should be done. Yeah. That's administrative. That's administrative mm -hmm. issue. That's not a website yeah. issue. That's yes. Yeah, what you both said. Okay. Uh, Are there any other I do have a question for this. Is and I realize this is very preliminary, so you 
probably don't have an answer. But was this something that the idea was that it would be done in house, or the idea like were you looking at no plans whatsoever yet? Okay, I don't That's, know yet. Yeah. Okay. I mean, obviously, there's some. If we can do it in house, there's some colleagues, obviously, that have. The, I know there's some some districts around us that have updated. So, I, you know, I would I would look at that the, what they've done and get some direction. Can I back up to a discussion <clears throat> uh, when we were talking about the Brandywine Virtual Academy? Uh, connected to what we were talking about with charter schools, obviously, but connected but separate. I just want to amend my comments and, and kind of make sure it doesn't fall till next year when we have to approve the virtual academies increase again. Uh, <clears throat> at some point, not saying now, my suggestion would be, because I think, I think you have direction given for where we want to go for now with charter school, but at some point I think we need to look at, uh, unless it's already been done, this virtual academy, why are we using them? Because I talked about, oh, we should get with other districts and look into is it cost worthy to, you know, put something out there uh, to the community as far as advertisement. I still think that's that's worthy of discussion. Once we know that Brandywine, and maybe we already do, Brandywine Virtual Academy is something to really push and promote and, you know, throw money into advertising. You know, what, what uh, this is what the CCIU uses, what do other Montgomery County schools use? What do other, you know, districts in Chester County use? If this is the program worthy of uh, <clears throat> investing in advertising, then, you know, having that discussion of is it worth, you know, will it pay for itself to, you know, advertise like we see the other charter schools advertised? Uh, I'm, I may be out of slightly out of order, but I'd like to go back to the website problem. Mm -hmm. And I just on my cell phone logged in to Potts Grove School District website. And if you direct the camera, you will see the screen is designed for a computer. It does not it does not transform. Uh, if you go to eBay, the page accommodates itself to the smaller screen size. So this is just a problem with our website. If you go to my personal website, uh, depending on what happens, you will get, if you log in with a cell phone, you will you should get directed to go to a computer. <laughs> the site's not set up for this kind of screen. Uh, so uh, uh, this is just a comment about the problems that we need to address, and it is a deep problem. This has got to look different than the website mm -hmm. that you get on your computer. Huh. Okay. Pretty good. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, sir. Okay, so finally, hmm? what, there's more? Yes, please. Yeah, could I, could I just do two quick ones? Um, and then they will really be quick. Uh, everybody has a, a budget calendar. I had the audacity to give it to everybody. Um, the, but I wanted to tell you, please review it, and if you have any questions, you can give me a call. Um, the Act 1 index was released this week. The base Act 1 index is 2.6%. Our adjusted index will be either 3.3 or 3.4%. Uh, that's it for that. Second, a couple weeks, a couple of meetings ago, I mentioned to you that uh, we were looking for board representation on a wellness committee. Uh, that wellness committee is meeting on Thursday at four o'clock in the district office. If anyone would like to attend. Okay. Anybody else? I just wanted to bring up, I had a chance, and I appreciate, um, we got the Max Mead at last uh, board meeting, and I actually had a time to look at it, and I cannot believe the talent we have in our school with the creativity of the drawings and the photography and the poems and the stories, and I'm just blown away. So um, I'm going, if you don't mind, Gary, if you could please come up and give us a little background on this. 
This is just absolutely amazing. And we should be very proud of our students for doing this. Sure. The, the Maximi started uh, a long time ago. It was really a, a way for students to showcase their artwork. We've used uh, uh, art shows throughout the buildings, um, in each of the buildings for art shows, but this has been a, a culminating program for them uh, each year. Um, there was a time when we had this printed every year, and a few years ago that stopped due to cost, et cetera. So um, we brought that back to be able to um, make sure every student that participates and um, contributes gets a copy so that they can move it on to, if they're going to art school, they can put it in their portfolio or as a memento, et cetera. Um, but Mrs. Caldwell, uh, Della Caldwell, is the advisor, and um, there's an online piece that they do as well, and, and I have that link, but also we make sure that we print enough for, obviously, the board so that you can see their talents, but also for every student that, that contributes, they, they, too get a, uh, they too get a copy. So that's kind of the genesis of it. It's been around for a long, long time. Um, we had a little bit of a blurb where we stopped for a while of printing it, but uh, as you can see, I think it's probably one of the best productions that, uh, um, that, we've, that we produce, and these kids are tremendously artistic and talented. Just, just wondering, is there any way we could link this on a web page so we could go through this or any place? We can, and it's it's, it's a big this? it's a big file. It's that's that yeah. was that's been one of the issues because it's so dynamic and large. But uh, we're working on that right now. Mrs. I just talked to Mrs. Caldwell today, so uh, we're working on. It. it has to be a link. It can't be just a post. So because of the volume of it, so. Sure. Um, I actually have a question for you. Is that open to any student in the high school? Like they said they would like to contribute art. Yep. There any student, and yes. you know they have to meet the criteria. But there's photography, there's poetry, there's um, you know you can see from the variety of artistic uh, you know pieces in there that uh, it's open to anybody, any student. They make announcements throughout the year, and it's like I said, it it culminates at the end of the year because it's a year-long project and then we print it in the summertime. That's why you that's why you get it every year in the beginning of the year. You know, I don't know if it's still done this way, but when Brady was um, maybe a junior, um, it was sort of like a club um, where they everyone who contributed, can you guys attest to this? Is it still that way? Go ahead, you take it. Yes, uh, there's a pride period for Maximi where a lot of the students would gather and contribute to the magazine. Do you have to be in that pride period? Do you have to be in that pride period in order to contribute or? Oh, no, right. no, you can email submissions. Yeah, I had Miss Caldwell in class and she literally was like, doodle on the back of your thing. I just doodled a poem and she threw it in there because she thought it was good. So whatever she, Caesar's given to her, she throws in there. It's open to everybody. Anything else? Thank you, Gary. I had a concern with the AP testings this, uh, this year. In the past, it's always been uh, some point in March, the students have to make a decision. They've had you know the year to go through class, they have to make a decision if they want to take the AP exam and pay for it. This year, uh, this past week, students were given something saying, guess what, you have to decide by October 4th, and if you don't decide to take it and pay for it by October 4th, you've got two or three days, there may be a fine if you, or a penalty if you don't pay for it, but it has to be done then by you know, October 4th and decide even though our students haven't really had a chance to try the class. A lot of times students take the AP classes because it's a challenging class and they may or may not want to take the exam depending on the college they're going to go to is going to, you know, accept the credits. But we're asking them before they've even, you know, really decided on that, that you're going to have to pay up front. And I'm, I'm a little bit confused because I told, I had emailed the school asking about this and it was passed up chain. I received an email back saying, it was because it was, rec was recommended from the college board. And that's sort of correct in the sense that on their schedule, they do say 
they recommend October 4th. However, they go on to say that even though we're requesting payment in full by October 4th, it's really not due until June 15th, which is a little bit of a light time. Um, plus, also, it's not required to register until June, November 15th. June yes. 15th. Um, let me just make sure about that. It might be June. Yep, June 15th. Say, can, you, can, you, can you repeat that again? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's, due, the, that's the bill. Our, yes, we have to. So like, if you go to the website, it says that students you know, at that by June 15th, that's when it has to be postmarked or sent in. That's when the district has to pay for the tax. Yes, correct. So, but we're asking the students to pay on, like, by October 4th. And we're also making, having them to decide by October 4th, even though the College Board is saying that you have until November 15th to decide after November 15th, you can still decide to take the exam, but then there will be a $40 fee for that, additional fee. Sure. But we're asking for the students to, we're not giving them the extra time, and I'm not quite sure why, because the students have just started the class, and they're finding out whether, you know, sometimes the kids, we ask, we push our students, we ask them to challenge themselves. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they get into class where they realize, eh, maybe not. But they're still interested in class, so they're going to take it. Well, now we're saying you're going to have to decide within three weeks, really, if you're going to want to take the class or not, four weeks, excuse me, mm -hmm. as opposed to giving them eight weeks until November and then still giving like two weeks for us to gather a payment. Yeah. And I'm just trying to understand that. I mean, the College Board does say they recommend October 4th, but then they go on to give four examples, one of which did have October 4th as a date, but that was one where they required all their students that took an AP class to take the AP exam. And of the four examples they gave, two did require, require students to take AP tests if they took the AP class. Mm -hmm. The other two did not, and the payments ranged from upfront to February. And in fact, one of the ones that we required it was for February, and then there actually, no, there was one that was for March as well. Um, and then the decision was pretty much the November 1st to November 8th. That way, you know, they can meet the November, yeah, November 15th deadline. So, and I understand College Board wants to get kids committed to taking the test, because I mean, it, it is a money maker for them, but I'm not quite sure why we're not giving our kids more time to decide if it's right for them. Plus, like I said, not just if it's right for them, but if your student's taking a class for an AP exam and the colleges that they're looking at aren't going to accept it, granted, you might want to take the test to challenge yourself, but do you really want to be spending $85, possibly multiple times, knowing that the school that you're looking at now is going to say, that's nice, but not do anything with it. So I was just curious. Like, usually, we, you know, we make decisions with our students' best interest in mind, and this sort of feels like it was a reaction because the College Board actually made this change last year, mm -hmm. and we let the kids know about it last week. And just, you know, the other ones, like I said, there's two of the places that where the students are required, when they sign up in spring, that's when they actually sign a contract in spring the year before, saying they're going to take a test, you know, so they know, and then they have test um, meetings during the summer and emails during the summer, so the parents know the fee schedule, you know, that they are taking it. And again, we waited until the last minute, so I don't know if it was a, we just didn't, it was an oversight or, or what, but I'm just curious. I mean, I realized next year, this year the kids are going to know for next year. In the past, it's never been this way. You know, so this year is sort of like a transition year. I'm just, again, why are we making the kids decide so soon after they start taking the class? I mean, as I don't know, has it affected you two at all? Sorry to put you on the spot like that. It's but I'm doing fine. It. It's more frustrating than anything because our teachers, some of them expect us to take the exam, but I don't know how well I'm going to do in the class. I don't want to commit to taking an exam that I'm not sure that I will perform well on. So I, it's frustrating. Yeah, I, do, I totally agree. Uh, this is personally my first year taking AP, so I was kind of sketchy going into it. And we got those forms last week that are like, hey, your payments are due between this time frame. You don't have it in. You have like, an like a fee. 
and I always was like, oh, I have time to like kind of explore the class, see how it is, see if I really need to take the test kind of thing. So it's just everything kind of feels rushed now because I'm still kind of on the fence with do I actually want to spend money on taking this test kind of thing. Uh, some, some of the pieces um, obviously are, are dictated by a college board. So what, what I can do is I can get together um, with, and there's timelines that they, you, you just, there's a lot, of, a lot of different pieces that you just mentioned, but there are timelines that we have to stay within. Uh, so um, I will get together with Dr. Ziegler, you know, as soon as possible tomorrow, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, take a look at, uh, we'll talk to the counselors, we'll uh, talk to the, some of the teachers, and we'll, we'll, uh, well, it's not, yes, but, I, and here's the thing I got to understand, I, and that it's, and, and please, student, we always take the best interest, yeah. and, and of students in mind, so at times we have to make administrative decisions, and I look at you, and, and, you know, there's unintended consequences, we could, there's unintended consequences for a lot of things, unfortunately, that we try to do, um, so this oversight was by no means like we're not trying to, we're not trying to. I, I know, I know that the guidance staff had an opportunity to um, uh, do the tutorial from College Board, and that was the recommendation, and, and they felt that that at, at the time, and that's really as far as I got today. So, as far as moving dates further out to give our students six or eight weeks, uh, we can take a look at that. I'll take a look at that tomorrow, and we'll do what's applicable. The thing too is, I put myself my principal hat back on and say, you know. I might agree with this, like October 4th, to October 15th date, because I know I'm going to have to chase students, because students will not make decisions until the last minute. Families will not make decisions until the last minute. So once certain dates pass, I don't, I don't know, the, again, I have to check with Dr. Ziegler as far as all those particular rules, but I want to give all those students an opportunity so we don't leave anybody out where we get to a point where, oh, you missed the boat, now you can't take the test. I agree. I mean, I, my guess is that it was an oversight because, like I said, we've always made decisions for the best interest of our students. So that's why I can't help but think that it was, you know, looked over because, but it's very clear that, you know, November 15th, this is on their website, deadline for AP coordinates to submit the exam order. No payment due until June. But I, what and, I don't know, Jim, is what I don't know is, I don't know who's the payment, who's it due, is it the student's piece or, or, is, it, or is it the district writing a check? Like, I don't know. Like, and according to the website, it made a point of saying that students have to remember to make the payment? check payment out to, and I honestly can't remember which one it was, but in their mind, they were getting a check from the student because they said make sure it's made out to, okay. and I'll, I don't remember what it is. But it's just, you know, and I, I agree with you. You, know, the, what, you have to chase down students, and that's why... I mean, in my mind, like the one teacher where it is required, they gave until November 1st because 15th is that deadline. That gave them two weeks to, you know, okay, check the roster and say, okay, these five aren't taking it. Are you sure? Let me check with your parents, you right. know, glance counts or stuff like that. So mm -hmm. just October 4th just seemed we'll look at rushed, that. you know, like, yeah. hey, walk back to school, decide. We'll do that tomorrow. Okay. Yep, no problem. Thank you. That meeting turned around quickly. Should have quit at 8.30. All right. Well, we're going to try one more time. We're, we're now to public comment, because I'm just not going to take any more new business. Um, we, got, we got a comment here from Stacy Hebert, who wants to talk about the GPS that we talked about earlier. Stacy's still here. Did you hold out for, for the... Okay. It's uh, Stacy Bear, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so I just had a couple of questions about the GPS system. Does it have the ability for the principals, office staff, and or parents to have an app associated with it? Parents will not have that, no. Okay, is there an option for that? Or no. is it a cost associated that they can't have it, that we're not doing it because of cost? We're not doing it. Okay. Is there a reason? Privacy. Okay. And safety. Okay. I mean, with other school districts, 
you know, the Springford is one of them, Boyertown's one of them, they have that app. So that's my question. We've Has made a it, different decision than they have. Okay. So the principals and office staff won't have access to it, or they the principals will? principals and the office staff will. Okay, but not parents. Right. So we still have to call the yes. office. Okay. And that's the final decision? Nothing is ever final in this <laughs> world. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I think, too, wasn't there an additional cost for the app, just to kind of address that piece of the question? Yes, yeah, so we're, we're purchasing the base level uh, service, which did not incorporate that. There's, there's always more discussion that we can have. There's no reason. There's issues of... difficulty around custodial rights with students. There's issues of lots of different legal issues about students that we don't want to get into of safety and who has the application and who wants to know where, this, where they are, who has the ability to track where the buses are. Because it's not just parents who would have the ability to track the buses. Anybody can have that app. We don't want just anybody tracking the buses. We want to limit it to our school district personnel to know where the buses are. That's the reason that we're limiting the access. It's not because we don't like parents. It's not because we don't trust parents. It's because we care about our students. We're maximizing the safety to our students so that the people that we know, the people that we have clearances on, the people that we trust, the people that we are accountable to are watching over our students and the people that we have knowledge of and that we have vetted are the ones that we are having watch these students. If we let anybody have access to it, we can't control what happens and who's watching and who's going to be at the bus stop waiting for your child. Does that make more sense? From a standpoint of, I mean, you could something be done where you sign in and you have to have a login, you know, and a password so that not anybody can have access to it. I'm not saying it's, it's public information, you know, but any app out there, you know, you have to have a, a username and password, you know, so that could be something that would be assigned, you know, through the district. And I understand the safety aspect of it, but from a parent side, you know, the safety aspect as, as well, not knowing where your child is, you know, and, it, and it's tough to get through, you know, the principals and the teachers do their best that they can to communicate to us, but even in an emergency situation, you know. We're walking before we can run. We're, we're, one, we're implementing this as the first step. We're gonna make sure that this whole, this whole thing, where everybody's, do, everybody's done it, we're late to the party. We're going to put this system in place. We're going to make sure everything works. We're going to get all the kinks out of it. And then incrementally, maybe next year, we'll, we'll add that application in. Um, it's, it's not a big deal. It's $17,000, $15,000 plus the, the, the adding, adding things. We do this all the time where we do a little bit at a time, and then we'll upgrade it as the, as the year goes by. Okay. Um, this is typically how we do most of the things that we do um, because we see that Oh, this works. You know, it makes sense that we upgrade it next year or in two years or whatever. Because it's just, why didn't we do this right at the beginning? Oh, because it was maybe twice the cost or whatever. But we like, we like to do things a little bit at a time. We like to ease into it. We don't do the whole thing all at once. Conservative, stupid, take your pick. However, however you want to you look at it. We tend to do things slowly and gradually as opposed to all the way, all at once. Mm -hmm. um, cautious, I, I, don't, I don't know what word you want to use, but we like to look at doing it 
in a way that's controlled and more cautious. Beta testing. Beta testing. Okay. I don't. I don't know. Yes, no, we're, I understand. We're, we're we're watching out. We're trying to watch out for the students. We're trying to do things that make sense. Um, the, the reason we got into this in the first place was because the state auditor general didn't like our using pencils and papers and how we calculated our mileage. That's why we're doing it at all, to be honest with you. Um, and, you know, so kind of dragging us into the 21st century despite our best efforts. Um, so we're doing this, you know, so fine we had to do it, so we're doing it. Um, and it's a big step for us to do this. And, you know, in a, in a year or two, we'll, we'll bring you along as, with us in the next step. When we want to get, bring the app to your to your phone. All right. Thanks for your question. It didn't get any better, did it? All right. So with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Some of. Thank you so much. <laughs>